You call yourself an artist. On what ground? Drown, baby, drown. Download the One Page Spotlight app for artists. Uh, probably, uh, I believe all of most of you know each other, and then, and I believe that the panelists need not be reintroduced as of now. And most of us have been uh, talking to each other for some time. So you know, the the, the our panelists titled "Writing for Minorities" or "Writing by Minorities," whatever. Okay, so you know, I like to first take I don't know, maybe. Uh, maybe like uh, uh, toss a few questions and uh, you know we could take turns by responding uh, you know we could take turns and respond to them and then you could you know we, we could take, uh, carry on from there so firstly like uh, like you know uh, i had this question that how do we define uh, what is today perceived as a minority in a literary in a literary ecosystem like more, uh, like all for us all for us being writers poets journalists like even science fiction writers you know how does the term minority apply to us or is it generally defined or is it that uh, you know i believe all four of us have four different uh, versions of the same story something like that so, i like to i like to uh, you know first hear from mimi if that is the order uh, you know yeah okay um so if if the audience doesn't know so i i write science fiction and fantasy mostly and i grew up in kolkata and um now i live in new york which is not something i ever expected like nobody in my family really lived abroad and um the one thing i want to come to it as so when i say that i'm a science fiction and fantasy writer i make that distinction like i'm i'm almost forced to make that distinction because i live in america and in america literary fiction and science fiction and fantasy are two different industries so they have two different sets of people and sometimes they have two different conversations and the conversations don't intersect unlike in india like you know when i come back to india I, when my work is contextualized in india i am among everybody who writes prose fiction right so literary fiction science fiction everybody's the same person same people and the reason i make this point is that in science fiction and fantasy in america there's a lot of conversation about minorities there are a lot of writers from marginalized backgrounds who are winning awards who are writing some of the most moving and important stories here right and in america largely the term that's used is person of color and so person of color people of color also in america encompasses savarna hindus and in america the larger number of indians are savarna hindus because of the kind of selection that happens while coming to america right like america doesn't take poor people from india america takes like you know doctors and engineers like you know extremely high value these are people which basically means that um the number of savarna hindus and the number of extremely privileged savarna hindus in america like that percentage is higher than what's actually the case in india right and when i'm in the science fiction fantasy industry where um i i like to not say that nobody else is dalit because maybe somebody else is and i am not acquainted with them like i try my best not to make the blanket statement that makes somebody else invisible but i haven't met the literators like the only somewhat marginalized but differently marginalized not really south asian people that i've met are caribbean writers caribbean indians the caribbean indians bring in a different kind of intersectionality to being south asian but they're not they're not really south asian they're generationally not citizens of south asia many of them don't have family histories of being south asian and some of their backgrounds may be dalit but they don't always identify as dalit 
but I have not seen much Dalit conversation in the fields that I'm in. And I am constantly navigating Savarna Hindus being people of color in my field. And like, especially because science fiction and fantasy, it's a, you know, it's a mythologizing genre, right? So there are so many Savarna Hindus writing about their gods in a very praised rhetoric, right? And it's supposed to be like these immigrant people of color, you know, preserving their own uh, ethnic background, which, I mean, which is a problem that we see in politics as well. Like, you know, Indian American politics, the, polit the political power that a lot of these Savarnas who pay to right-wing governments, campaigns and things like that, they, they, you know, they're bringing in the dollars and they're bringing in the dollars in the name of tradition. And that is a thing that reflects in my industry where most of the non-South Asian Americans don't even know what Dalit is. But I, I'm, I'm constantly dealing with like looking at a lot of South Asian fiction, which is not very caste sensitive. Sometimes it's caste harmful, you know, being sold and seen as progressive, diverse fiction. And that is the field that I'm writing within. And um, that's, that, that's the context I wanted to bring in. Yeah, so uh, like, I'd like to pose a few que questions specific to your response. You know, uh, have you ever felt that you did have a choice to like not assert your Dalit identity when you're in America? That is, you're, you're like, uh, you've been introduced as a panelist or as a poet or, you know, like a fiction writer. I, I never get introduced as Dalit, really. I mean, I do largely events in the science fiction exactly. field and I am never introduced as Dalit. In fact, I once wrote a Dalit story, like, the only story which was like overtly angry in like, I was trying to emulate like the, you know, the Dalit anger from a lot of um, Dalit authors in India. I, I wouldn't say I was successful, but I was trying. And that story got a lot of negative reactions. So that story got positive reactions from India. Like people have written to me, a small amount of people who said, you know, I really loved the stories. It was something that worked for me that story was made invisible in this industry because some Savarna Hindu Indians, you know, complained about it. And they were, I mean, there's like this huge, I mean, you know, especially when we're in like the marginalized um, author conversation, it's very important to lift everybody else up, right? Like there's a conversation about you don't destroy the career of other marginalized people. And, and the thing is basically the Savarna Hindu authors, I mean, not all of them, but some of them said that this person just basically doesn't play along with us. This person is bringing up a marginalized identity that's false, which is a thing that happens, you know, I can't think that Savarna Hindus say in India too, but they just basically said that this is, um, a bad person. This this person is not friendly. This person is not supportive of our careers, and um, so yeah. So in my field, I'm actually heavily discouraged to be Dalit. I would rather say, and if I do write about being Dalit, and that is something. So science fiction fantasy has a lot of black authors, you know, and that is a tradition that I follow a lot, or at least I read about a lot, and. A lot of Black authors write about Blackness by making it secondary world, like, you know, putting it in an imaginary world, because, you know, the thing about Lion King, like, you know, people would empathize about, Af empathize with African lions more than they would empathize with African people. So if you make them imaginary people, people identify with, like, Black people's experience more, like the non-Black people if it's into, you know, superimposed upon a comfortable secondary world, as opposed to if it's written by black people. And like a lot of my fiction just basically does not identify Dalit characters as Dalit. Like they are Dalit, like there are Dalit markers. There are like little conversational cues. If you look at them, you'll know that this is Dalit character, but sometimes the people who don't know what Dalit is will not. And then they're not very openly confrontational because that's what I learned after that story really badly backfired. I know that in a field where like Savarna Hindus are people of color, I will not survive. I will not survive if I don't, if I write openly. 
angry anti-Savarna literature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I have a few more, you know, uh, interesting afterthoughts now that I listen to you. First is that so being a literary artist, being an artist, your marginality or your uh, our you, all of us, all four of us, our unique experience of perceived suffering. You know, this gives us a unique perspective to conceive a work of art, which the you know person who has not undergone that particular strand of suffering may never imagine. That's one. Secondly, like I, I don't know if I'm thinking too much. So there was recently a book by name Cast by Isabel Wilkinson, oh, which, yeah. did, which 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 did have a, a lot of you know a lot of uh, a lot of discussions on that. And uh, primarily, the interesting uh, whatever observation was that you know she was trying to unravel certain very systemic systemic inequity that the Western Hemisphere has, and she identifies two societies outside the West. Maybe Germany is also this, but still Germany and India, where there is strikingly stark startlingly similar uh, hierarchy, you know? So, and I don't know if uh, this m- may have helped uh, understanding, you know, the understanding of caste system as we perceive in India, in the West. But most, most of the reviews of this book in India has been negative in the sense that she was supposed to have not really understood caste. But that is understandable, you know? It's, it's not about that part, about that analogy. I'm talking about like the larger inequity that she may have tried to expose that may inspire all four of us, something. Let me hear what the other two have to say about yeah. this. I have. Yeah, so you know, I'd like to pass, uh, pass the baton on to say our friend uh, Drupa Jodi, who's I believe, uh, you know, is one of the rare uh, Dalit journalists uh, in, in the, uh, you know, in Indian media establishment. And uh, it, uh, the, the la- absence of Dalits in the newsroom is something that has been dwelt upon heavily, heavily. And secondly, uh, Drupo like asserts his twin marginalities of being queer and Dalit, and, uh, and talks about the intersection and you know whatnot. So you know, I'm in, like, you know, I'm just waiting to hear from <laughs> from Drupo. Yeah. Um, thank you for uh, asking me to talk. And again, uh, I think it's a real honor to be a part of this panel and to hear uh, all of you speak. Um, I'm just going to take off from where uh, actually Mimi left off about uh, how um, caste uh, identities are able to kind of monopolize spaces uh, and what it does to both writing and in my case, reporting and journalism. Um, In uh, the newsroom or or in Indian media, for example, the uh, dominance of uh, certain castes, uh, what it does is it not only uh, creates a vacuum uh, when it comes to uh, representation, when it comes to uh, uh, coverage of news, but it also creates stereotypes about who the news is for and what news is. Uh, so if there are no, for example, no Dalit people in the newsroom, uh, the idea that Dalit people can also be the target audience for a particular media house never enters the lexicon. So like so 280 million people um, are never seen as the audience or as never seen as the consumer of news. Uh, similarly, uh, issues that are, um, A, issues that are important to these marginalized communities are never seen as important enough or newsworthy enough uh, issues. And finally, um, even for, uh, so-called mainstream issues, um, the kind of perspective that we get, the kind of expertise that we get are always uh, caste supremacist or are always uh, higher, quote unquote, higher casted, right? So for example, uh, when we talk about the economy, when we talk about gender, uh, and especially in my case, when we talk of sexuality, when we talk of uh, education, uh, health, uh, 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 employment, uh, these are all questions that are deeply important to marginalized communities, very, very important to Dalits. And yet these are issues uh, where Dalit people, on the perspective of Dalit people, find absolutely no mention. Uh, for me, it has been important to look at this from a Dalit queer perspective. And the reason for that is, uh, as uh, I work uh, in a national organization, um, I write on elections and na- national affairs. It's been important to think about what it means for queer people, 
And the reason that it's been important is because so much of what we do and how we think about the country is based on caste, desire, and sexuality. Unfortunately, in South Asia, but more specifically in India, uh, queerness has been, uh, quote-unquote, the monopoly of a certain number of higher castes who have determined mm -hmm. not just what queerness is, but what desire is, what uh, good queerness is, what queer subjectivity is, and uh, what in general desire and sexuality is all about. Mm, and it is extremely important to not just think about caste and desire in the same bracket, uh, because even spending 10 minutes in India um, makes you aware of the fact that so much of our desire is deeply casted but also to think about what uh, queerness can do uh, to dismantle caste and uh, in what ways uh, are caste and queerness uh, intersecting with each other. That's interesting. That's interesting. So, uh, so I just have an afterthought. So do you think the, uh, you know, the rise of the Sangh Parivar has reset uh, the rights won by queer minorities by at least a decade. Is that so? Is that a, a, a correct reading? Or do you think, you know, a lot of legislation, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, you know, moving the needle in a progressive, uh, towards a progressive trend that got reset because of the right, uh, rise of the right wing? Is that true? Like, uh, um, I just want to, uh, yeah, uh, um, I think uh, there has been a way in which uh, what we think of traditionally as uh, but, you know, the right to dissent, freedom of speech that have come under, uh, that are increasingly being contested uh, in India. But what is also important to note is that uh, queerness is not, uh, or at least the queer movement in India is not, uh, 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 and, and the right wing are not two kind of dissimilar uh, subsets. Uh, in fact, there is a growing sentiment of uh, uh, closeness to right wing or, or uh, right wing uh, kind of uh, adjacent feelings of partiality to right wing within the queer movement. So there are many, many queer activists, uh, workers who are uh, in favor of the government, uh, who are uh, who describe themselves as proud Hindus, uh, who describe themselves as proud right wing activists. Um, so uh, I would suggest that, and, and, and so at least in my opinion, there is no kind of dissonance between these two anymore. That's, that was a very, like, I don't know, uh, that rattled me, <laughs> to be frank. You call yourself an artist. On what ground? Drown, baby, drown. Download the One Page Spotlight app for artists. Moving on to Husaifa, I believe uh, among the four of us, uh, four of us, the, the particular, the you know, the most, the writer who su uh, suffers most, the highest intensity of being other, you know, the in the, in the South Asian imagination, the you know, the uh, the, uh, the the very need to question nationality or like you know the very. I don't know the sense of belonging or whatever. Like, so we go to uh, we go to the West. Uh, we, we will be like called Asian Americans. I don't know. Uh, like uh, some kind of, we have a tax, some kind of something like that. But I don't know. But within India, I like I believe like uh, Husayfa, somebody who has suffered the direct oppression of the state. Like Kashmir is like I don't know. I I, I like I'm eager to listen to what Husayfa has to say. Um. Yeah, so I wanted to take off from the first question of minority when you ask what's a minority in India. Uh, so to uh, to me, minority comes, you know, it comes as consciously something that we have grown up with. As a Kashmiri, you know, when I went to first to something, when I first took you know, when I first attained consciousness, one of the first memories is that of, as I have reportedly spoken, is that of, uh, you know, armed crackdowns, or that of a young neighbor being killed. 
Right. So in context of that, the minority, we fulfill the minority in both senses of the word. Although we are a majority in Kashmir, numerically wise, but we are a minority in that there's no power. All right. There's complete disenfranchisement, especially after August 2019. All right. Post August 2019, the process has been hastened. And under the current regime, when every kind of, you know, uh, when every kind of freedom is being contested, it's a continuation of the old traditions that have already been part of Kashmir, that have already been prevalent and tested in Kashmir. What you are seeing in the nation right now is a larger practice, all right, is a, what you see, already have seen in Kashmir, what has been you know, already practiced and refined in Kashmir. So whether that be, you know, using the judiciary or the law to stifle forces, whether that be the use of, you know, militia guns, to whether that be the use of brute force to silence opinion. Also, in this state, whatever the state is today, whatever the country is today facing, has already been faced by the country. So in that sense, when we ask about minorities, so Kashmiris can count themselves as minorities in their own land because we have been at the receiving end of, you know, subjugation since, not just since 1947, but 1847, when the Treaty of Amritsar is, you know, uh, signed. And I make this a point. A lot of people think that Kashmir issue is only a residue of partition, which it is not. I think it is a residue of partition, but there's a deeper history than that. We must remember that Kashmir was sold for 75 lakh rupees by the British, all right, to the uh, to the Maharaja Gulab Singh, Maharaja Gulab Singh right, for 75 lakh Nanak Shahi, land, stock, and barrel, people were sold, which is a unique, which has been a unique treaty anywhere in the world, all right? And Maharaja Gulab Singh, to make, you know, uh, good his investment, imposed every kind of tax upon the poor Kashmiri. And the process of subjugation is a continuous process since then. It did not stop with 1947. It has not stopped in the new millennium. And it's a continuation. It has continued ever since. So if we talk about minorities, with the feeling of minoritism, you know, that has been something that is a part of collective Kashmiri subjectivity. That's a part and parcel of what we grow up with, the sense of being othered, the sense of being deprived, and the sense of having every liberty contested, and the fight for the liberty, all right? Liberty in every, in the broadest sense, not just liberty of political liberty, but liberty in the broadest sense, to speak, to speak especially, all right? So in Kashmir, we really do see the minority, you know, what minority has been truly called as disenfranchised people. And here we share this intersectionality with Dalits, all right? That Dalit, unlike like Dalits, you know, we too have been othered and beaten into a corner by the Savarna Hindus, all right? Because the Indian mainstream is the Savarna Hindu. And the regime itself is Savarna Hindu regime. So for ninety, for most part of the time, we share a uh, you know this intersectionality with Dalits, even though a lot of Dalits, you know, has now moved on to support of the state. But still, the basic fundamentals remain the same. The feeling of otherness and the feeling of powerlessness and subjugation remains the same. I mean, this just reminds me that um, I wrote an op-ed about Kashmir in um, July 2019, and it did not get published. It wasn't allowed to get published. And I call the Indian state a colonizer in it, and I, I don't know if that's why that was the case. I was publishing it in India, did not go through. And uh, I was basically told, you're not a Kashmir expert. So, you know, we have in-house Kashmir experts. It's fine. You write about something else. Yeah, that can <laughs> happen too. We have to be very careful with the choice of words, you know, in here, and especially in the current environment and climate. So, I mean, I are we not allowed to say that the Indian state is a colonizer because that is the case? Ah, 
Well, we are not allowed to say that. Let's put it like that. We are not allowed to say that anymore. We were not allowed to say it even before, but under the even current before. regime, under the current regime, the processes have been tightened. You know, the pressures have been increased many fold. So where speaking has been criminalized like never before. So it's very integral that one chooses uh, synonyms. So I prefer the term subjugation, quote unquote, you know, as a synonym, as a larger synonym to hide, to maybe euphemisms, all right? So to call the state subjugation, subjugators, all right? So that's what we have constantly negotiate between, you know, these words and language, you know, and the positions, because that's how we survive in Kashmir. Survival in Kashmir teaches you that you have to constantly, you know, watch your step and like, constantly guard your stance. So, yeah, that's why it wasn't published. No, I am increasingly so sorry. No, yeah, please go. Yeah. So, I just wanted to say that so I haven't been back home in uh, two years, which is like the longest that I haven't been back home, and part of that was because of the pandemic. Um, so, I mean, although I live in America, I I'm not a green card holder. I'm like a small time visa holder that keeps getting renewed. And I am so worried about the censorship that has happened in the like increased in the last two years because I'm just not getting an on the ground view of it. So I don't know what I'm not allowed to say anymore because obviously there isn't like an official list of all these things that you're not allowed to say. But sometimes you just say something and you get a repercussion. And because I'm not actually at home, I don't know what those words are because I think you need to have like your ear to the ground to know what can get you in trouble, right? And that is just so scary. Like, this is not the country that I hope to grow up in. And yeah, I just but, wanted to say that. But that's always been the case in Kashmir. With Kashmir, yeah. You know, in Kashmir, it has always been a case of watching your step and censorship. I'm sure that's an experience Indians are now experiencing. But as Kashmiris, we have already experienced this all our lives. So yes, in this and, age, and how, I, do I just, you, how do you get to listen to some authentic voices from Kashmir? If at all, you know, such a voice exists. No, such voices exist. Of course, such voices exist. It comes through, for example, there's a lot of scholarship happening on Kashmir. Uh, for example, Ratledge is coming up with a volume on Kashmir, critical Kashmir studies. A lot of poetry is being published from Kashmir. Novels are being published from Kashmir. A lot of literature is being produced from Kashmir and some of it by quite good presses. And a lot of us are writing poetry. You know, so if you want to hear what the Kashmiri voice is, authentic Kashmiri voices, you need to turn towards the literature or the land to understand what the authentic Kashmiri voice is, rather than relying on the mainstream news, right? Rather than relying on newspapers, what you need to do is come to Kashmir or take any anthology of Kashmiri poetry or take you know, any Kashmiri specific issue journals, for example, Kashmir Lit, right? And go through it to understand the real situation on ground. So, do you think uh, uh, there has been a dramatic change in the way uh, life has been in Kashmir from, say, 2019? Or has Kashmir been like this for the last so many years? So why I'm asking you is, is that. So, 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 so if I were to engage with a young writer writing today, so is, is it that he is in a new epoch kind of situation? Or is he uh, in, in that tradition of uh, literature that has come from Kashmir? Um, I think the answer is both yes and no. I mean, to an extent, uh, the situation is 
a continuation of what Kashmir has always been. For example, I have grown on both sides of, uh, you know, 2019. I have seen both sides. You know, I have seen the 90s. Uh, I saw the 2010, 2008, 9, 10. I saw 16. I have seen 19. So I started writing pre-19. I have started writing shaped by the rebellions of 2008, 9, 10. We were grown, we grew up in the Burhanwani, post Burhanwani era. All right. So, yes, in that sense, there is a continuity of tradition. So, what you see today is, you know, a tradition that has already been forged uh, since, you know, 90s. Those people who started writing from 90s, whether that be, for example, Hamdam Kashmiri in Urdu. All right. So the right tradition has already been there of dissent and of, you know, uh, writing against writing against the grain, uh, writing back to the state. But post-2019, what I feel is that the process has gained a new urgency because now, you know, there was an earlier, there was no sense of identitarian threat per se. Now there's a definite identitarian threat. Now there's a definite chance that, you know, you are going the Palestine way, all right? And now your identity is increasingly under challenge, all right? So there has been a new urgency. And post, you know, these two uh, blockades, we had the 2019 uh, lockdown, and now we had the COVID lockdown, but post 2019 lockdown, it sort of has given literature a new impetus. It gave a lot of time and it gave, has given a lot of uh, stimulation to the people, to the young minds, to write about what they have experienced now firsthand in the last years. So there's a new urgency that has come. So for example, I'm editing a volume right now by this young boy who says surviving 22 years in Kashmir. All right. So earlier there was no such notion of earlier that would take, you know, you wouldn't think of, you know, survival. You wouldn't think of your identity as being threatened. You would think of yourself being threatened, the body being threatened. But identity you always presumed was safe. You know, you never presume that, you know, you would be, tomorrow there would be a situation when there would be no Kashmiri left, no Kashmiri quote-unquote left. You thought the Kashmiri body wouldn't be left. That's a separate thing, all right? The Kashmiri body wouldn't be left. That's a separate thing. But you always thought that the Kashmiri language, the culture, the people, you know, the idea would linger on. But now, since 2019, I see a new urgency has come because there's this increasing fear that that may also be erased if it moves on as it is. You call yourself an artist. On what ground? Drown, baby, drown. Download the One Page Spotlight app for artists. So I, I had this, I uh, had this uh, observation that you know. So I, I used to wonder if you know if Drupal or Saifa were to you know uh, thinking of writing a poem or a short story. Do you imagine or do you look up to a literary predecessor? Do you think you know somebody has there? There are you know some kind of uh, some some kind of work that is similar to us, but not really what we want, right? But you know, that we could always look up to. There is some kind of ideal or a yardstick sort of thing. Uh, you know, is that even a, is this even a valid question <laughs> in the sense that, you know, I believe that in our generation, a lot of marginalized writers like Dalit or like queer or a kind of Muslim, Muslim identity in Kerala, which are very marginalized and who have a very distinct mafla identity or people who are uh, from the coastal dialects or from the tribal communities and they have their own specific dialect. Then they have Malayalam, then they have English. You know, they are in a, in a very intersectional world and then they maneuver all these words to, you know, 
uh, to make their voice heard heard in, in our generation. That is something like the Rohit Bimla sort of generation where the English language is access, accessible to us. We are on the social media. We, we, we have read our certainty from Bedkar. And you know, we, we identify, you know, it's like we have, we have an informed generation who could speak about the community to the world, to the world, whichever community you are from, you know, whatever specific geographic location or uh, birth or you know, acquired identities that you have. So you know, I'd like to know if some of you have a notion of uh, you know, some kind of writer who whom you look up to or like whatever. Um, Josefa, would you like to go uh, first? Um, uh, I, you know, we, uh, there's of course first Aga Shahid Ali, who everyone in Kashmir uh, looks up to because we grew up reading Aga Shahid Ali post 2008. That's when the, you know, consciousness. I have repeatedly said that, you know, the dichotomy between Indian and the Kashmiri struck me only in 2008. Till then, it was a seamless transition, you know. It wasn't, the dichotomy did not exist for us. It was only in 2008 that the dichotomy came clear to us. And that's when we started uh, reading Aga Shahid Ali, the country without the post office especially. So one that has been an influence on every one of us who write. But more specifically, I think uh, my writing has been shaped a lot by Faz and Mahmoud Darvish. All right. So I've written my PhD on both of them. All right. And during the course of my PhD, I came to be heavily influenced by, especially by Faz and Darvish. All right. I came to understand that how to you know, incorporate a literary tradition, how to incorporate your own tradition and merge them within the larger idiom of English, all right, to create, uh, especially Darvish, he, you know, sort of expanded. In sort of reading Darvish, I sort of expanded my frontiers, all right, because he opened up a new world to me wherein he would use a lot of mythology, and a lot of geography of the land to convey. So the land becomes a you know metaphor for him. So that is where I connected with Darvish. So I would say that if I were to look up to someone, I look up to these three. You know, Shahid, Mahmoud Darvish, and Faz, who incidentally I all three I wrote a PhD on. So that was why, in fact, I chose these three for my PhD. And these in turn have largely influenced me and I do look up to them. Right. Um, I actually have uh, two quick uh, responses to uh, Chandra Bohan's uh, question. Uh, one is when it comes to queerness, um, I think, uh, yes, there is a surfeit of literature, um, especially from the late nine, uh, from the late eighties uh, till now. Uh, in South Asian contexts. Um, and uh, one does look up to uh, uh, that kind of so-called queer canon in South Asia when uh, thinking and writing about queerness and desire. But what is, I think, far more important to me is to think about uh, what, um, how do, uh, how does one think about uh, queer writing or writing of queer people in non-English languages. Mm, and that's something that I've been thinking and uh, kind of learning from, especially uh, in Hindi or in Bengali, um, in um, say the contexts of everyday writing in newspapers, um, in as blogs, as love letters, etc. Uh, and that's been important because uh, especially in the context of Indian queer, uh, the Indian writing, uh, queer writing by Indian writers. Mm, it's been important for me to note that, um, you know, there are so many uh, queer trans um, people uh, who are uh, possibly not represented by that canon, who come from Dalit or other caste marginalized backgrounds, uh, who are not seen as queer writers and whose writing is not seen as queer writing and whose desire is not seen as queer desire. Uh, and it's important for me uh, to kind of take uh, inspiration and in, uh, 
from that so so uh, to see the uh, lgbtqia movement uh, or the rights or the, or the fight for queer rights uh, as also a fight against caste oppression uh, right so um, for example i've been kind of over the past 2 3 um, years thinking about how um, how can we uh, come together to think of um, queerness in non english languages uh, coming from caste marginalized backgrounds right what does queerness look like uh, to a dalit person uh, who does not speak english and in what ways uh, does that location and those experiences change the way in which uh, we think of queerness we think of desire and we think of writing um, for example in uh, Uh, metropolitan cities of delhi and bombay it's very uh, common uh, for example to think of uh, queer desire or uh, you know a desirability as being english speaking right um, and english speaking often being a proxy for brahmin or other upper castes uh, what does queerness then do uh, either to break caste molds or to even to uphold them uh, can we think of queerness as a way to annihilate caste uh, and queer desire as a way to break from uh, the shackles of caste based sexualities so yeah that is just yeah um so i speak yeah um so um this is a question i think i have uh, i mean i've spent my whole life grappling with like you know terms like literary ancestors and um especially because i did an english degree you're you know if you do an english degree you're dropped in the middle of the canon and there you like it's pointed to you that these people are your ancestors right like your literary ancestors not your um biological ancestors and for people where your literary ancestors don't coincide with your biological ancestors right um like i clearly i grew up in a wave of indian literary fiction getting international attention right from the late 80s 90s and so on and um i just wanted to make a point that i identify as queer as well it's just um and it's it's one of those things where i i have to pick and choose my identities like there are many of like you know there four or five things that i could claim marginalization on and even if i wasn't asking for benefit even if i just said that i am these things people would some people would say this person just lives on ticking boxes you know so i i like there are just some, some of my identities i don't talk about as much because i just don't think i would be taken seriously if i talked about all of them and uh so i grew up um i grew up reading children's literature in bengali my parents are not very literary and they're not good at english and then i moved to english literature um at college at high school and at that time there was like the boom of indian literature in english happening and i learned a lot from those authors like i learned that you could write about india and then after a point you realize that they're not really representing my background they're like all people from like you know and that time these were all people who went abroad which i know sounds very paradoxical that i'm sitting in new york and saying that but you know 20 years ago that was not my background that was not my like those people did not represent families like mine and uh then i went to jadavpur university in india in calcutta where um it's a great english department it's also an english department where a lot of people a lot of the students are dynastic intellectuals and i wished i did not get to be told that but i wasn't allowed to preserve that innocence like somebody or the other like i'm you know first year college i'm just hanging out with other kids and somebody would come and tell you do you know who that girl's parents are and like by the end of the first year i like it was just drilled into me maybe not professors but it was systemically drilled into me that those students like these people are the children of important people and they are the ones who are going to have great careers and you may or may not be successful like you're a wild card it doesn't matter right and the more and more you get those drilled into you 
the more you feel alienated from the authors who are writing indian writing in english because you're like okay those people are from those families those people are from the families that have always been like you know the path to success paved for them and they they're not representing me and the queer thing i mean i know there like it, it's even harder to get female queer voices because female queer spaces are not public and female queer lives especially in india i'm using female as a placeholder but still like you know there are there are so many queer lives that are lived like a lot of women's queer lives are already lived within closed doors they're not really in public spaces so um i have struggled to find narratives even among dalit writers because a generation ago the dalit writers who were upheld largely were people from extremely oppressed backgrounds and i mean i have felt inauthentic sometimes like even this panel when i was coming in i like you know i was talking to a friend and i was like i i don't know if i'll come across as shallow like you know when i read an author like manoranjan bapari who is once again extremely deep extremely valuable material then you find a sentence or a perspective where like you know dalit people whose families or who themselves have not gone through such tremendously negative experiences as mine are not that their voices are not all that important and i just wonder is my voice important like am i too privileged as a perspective and it's also coming from inside the community right like these voices are coming from inside the community it's not just savarna hindus that are saying well you privileged dalit so like all these people are partly my literary ancestors because i'm bringing in all their experiences and also because i write science fiction like these are things like you know things like environment things like technology and these are things like the future of the world and there need to be more marginalized voices who bring bring their perspective into this because often it's like the marginalized people who are actually living close to the soil right like i have relatives in the medinipur district in bengal very close to the sundarbans so like you know when there's a flood when there's a climate related issue these are the people who are getting affected the most right these are the people who are losing their lives losing their livelihoods so so there has to be and there is happening a bigger intersection of dalit or not not dalit per se but at least marginalized voices globally in big global issues not just marginalized issues right like not just issues about marginalized people because you know any any big policy change big climate change big change in technology of the world like the people whose lives get upended are usually people who live very close to the soil like urban people their lives don't get upended their lives get inconvenient not upended so yeah i mean so literary ancestors are like you know i i read a number of black authors and and there's there's always been a precedent of taking um taking knowledge and wisdom from black authors and black activists in activism scenes across the world but you still have to modify it a little bit right like it's not exactly the same experience um i was recently and i am currently trying to write like you know in the epic fantasy mode like old history extremely old history about bengali dalits and it's very hard to find that because bengali dalit history is not tremendously well documented and also like you know bengal was a much more marginalized region bengal had a lot of admixture from the north from the east so it is it, it, it's a very different kind of spectrum and a lot of us are probably mixed caste honestly we are probably mixed race as well right so um yeah yeah that, that that is the thing i'm trying to write and i'm trying to draw from all these literary traditions like none of them seem to be my parents they're like uncles and aunts like literary uncles and aunts but they're not my ancestors because they don't fit my experience so how how about the idea that you know the lack of literary ancestors triggers something nascent something new 
you know you become adamic you become like a writer like mimi mondal or a writer like drubo becomes extremely important in the it's like the onset of a rivulet you know the you're writing because like there is nothing like that before you were you started putting pen to paper that's one thing secondly there could be that you know when you survey the kind of literature that you want to write as a, like for, first survey before you start into your own uh, composition what what could happen to you is that there could be a sense of alienation that can trigger something extremely creative you know like we've alienated with a kind of elitist texture and fragrance that indian english literature has up to now up to now but i you know, like, do also want to speak to that because what you're talking about is that your stakes are raised extremely high like you're you'll either produce a work of greatness or you'll produce a work that's a complete flop and that is also psychologically detrimental to most of us i suppose like when you're like you're not allowed to have an easy work you're not allowed to write an easy book and like i used to work in publishing in india right like so many savarna writers are writing easy books mid list and they're good enough they're having fun they're they're not challenging themselves they're not going through a lot of like you know mental pressure that gives you depression gives you anxiety and somehow we don't have that space we are either we have to be exceptional or we don't matter yeah great that's it <laughs> yeah so you know i'm uh, like maybe we can open the floor for like some free willing thoughts we have something you know, like something you want to think out loud i've generally observed that you know people who are successful you know uh, i believe that all four of us are sort of in a way successful in that we have we have this platform we have this platform because you know we have successfully made our voice heard right so uh, 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 the society perceives us as you know uh, the anomaly rather than the norm people think that if a uh, dalit person or a queer person or somebody from kashmir who is you know, who is undergone tremendous anguish he or she is bound to fail or like you know it's assumed that you know our quests may not bear the fruit that we aspire to and in a way, you know that's something you all share i don't know like, you know like that's one thing secondly there is this constant uh, uh, fear or pressure that you know if our identity markers were removed if the you know or the reader of a manuscript which is like anonymized Okay, so they didn't know that who was submitting these manuscripts or whatever. And if there are our identity where like sort of other identity markers were like sanitized and cleaned off, then will our work stand the test of time? You know, are we under pressure to write like, for example, myself? Am I under pressure to write generic poems that that make a mark as aesthetic work of art? You know, other than uh, you know probing into my cultural history. of being dalit or an empowered male in urban environment so these questions i you know i used to like <laughs> i used to like ponder you know if for example if, if 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 a poet like to say for does he get an invite uh, to a literary festival where he is not profiled as a kashmiri poet where he is not profiled as the uh, the, the voice from kashmir you know like there is this pressure on the on the uh, uh, lit fest organizers to include kashmir too so as a result to say as we like or the cipher's poetry stands the test of time as a poet par excellence with, with no uh, uh, qualifying tags attached you know like kashmiri or like muslim or like you know somebody who's combating the state or somebody who who who, who uh, suffers a, p- a pinch of being other or whatever you know now i'm just here to listen to like uh, probably so recently there was a uh, harper collins book of cure anthology i think uh, m- mine and drupo's works are there And there is a blur by Mimi Mondal, right? So uh, the three of us. Oh my God, there is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, I was just thinking, you know, how uh, I don't know, like what we write and what people think of us, and like uh, uh, you know, I don't know, a very, very, very existence of the artist, artistic self. Something like all of you would like to add to. Um, should I speak, or have I been speaking too much? You know, uh, uh, like. Maybe Dhruv Dhruv has something to say after that. Yeah, yeah. No, maybe he can go first, and after that, I can. No, no, no. Please do. Uh, no, I was just actually, uh, you know, when Chandrabhuan was talking about this, uh, I was also thinking about. Uh, I mean, I'm just kind of thinking about Dalit and queer writing, and how. Uh, and this we talked about before, but how one has to be relentlessly Dalit, right? So, especially in journalism, one often sees this kind of rubric of representation being used, right? So, on a table, how many Dalit people are allowed? How many queer people are allowed, right? Uh, and 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 this 
creation of artificial scarcity of position in space uh, then makes us uh, both fight for those scraps, but also creates that uh, anxiety, right? Am I uh, hogging too much space as a Dalit person? Am I really an authentic Dalit person? Do I really get to, uh, are there Dalit people who are more marginalized than me? Um, and the reason that this is important uh, is because there is so much uh, talk about quote unquote representation, right? Um, and yet nobody has ever at LitFest asked how many strategies in a table are enough strategies. Uh, right? um, uh, and the reason that this is important to me is because um, as kind of Chandrabhan rightly points out, uh, one feels that sort of pressure uh, to constantly uh, be queer, or to constantly be Dalit, or to constantly think about, can you can we write about, say, Karan Johar and get published? Like if in, in journalism, for example, there is this whole thing um, about uh, representation in the media and how the addition of Dalit journalists, the addition of journalists from caste marginalized backgrounds would add to uh, what Indian journalism offers to its audiences. Uh, and the argument that's often made is, you know, Dalit journalists are closer to the ground, they have an ear to uh, uh, people's movements, that they're able to cover people's issues better. Uh, but what if Dalit journalists want to cover fashion, right? Uh, what if they want yeah. to cover who uh, does better eye pros or, or which stylist is the best in Bombay? I think there is a way in which uh, especially in India, caste operates in journalism and literary circles that inherently casts certain subjects as casteless and others as casted. And, and the result of this is even somebody as Mili rightly points out as, as, as vivid as Monument and Lapari, that even there, uh, uh, in, in a recent article, uh, a literary critic describes reading uh, Dalit uh, writers and authors as guilt lit that you, you read these authors out of guilt. I do not know a single Dalit author who writes out of guilt. Uh, for example, Mimi's work gives us tremendous joy. It gives us vibrancy. It gives us uh, color, right? Um, and, and, and that's what's important to me. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is because I, I work a little in like literary event organization, but I largely do that in the US. And uh, so even at science fiction event organizations, and last year I actually um, helped, like I was a consultant in organizing a South Asian American literature festival online, of course, because everything was online last year. And uh, so what I see happening in the science fiction community, and I take um, some lessons from it, but there's a huge conversation that you don't always take the writers of color and put them on the writers of color 101 panel. Like, what is it to be the writer of color? Like, that's what the 101 is, right? And uh, sometimes the same writers are going to every event and doing that same panel, right? Like in various combinations. And after a point, people are like, people say, I don't want to do this. Like, I don't want to give like that basic, 101 is like the introductory lecture in um, you know American universities. That's what the term 101 comes from. It's like remedial English as a course is always gets the course number 101. That's where it comes from. So you're basically going in and introducing yourself, introducing what a writer of color means to different white people at every venue. Like at every venue, you're coming in and saying the same thing. And a lot of us are just like, you know, I want to be on the panel about robots. I don't want to talk about being a writer of color anymore, right? Like there, there should be a point where these other white people can go back and refer to the last time I talked about it. Like I don't have to go to their door and talk about how talking to a non-white person looks like, right? And that is a thing we should, like this is something obviously a certain person is not the only person who can do like if I if I'm the only person asking for this in the Indian literary community, given that I'm female presenting and everything, and I live in America, it's very easy for people to say, well, that privileged person has, you know, he has a privileged perspective. So this is a thing that has to be done from several people, where we just start have start saying that we need to be on panels on other topics. So when I was doing this literary event consultation, which 
did have a Dalit authors panel, but they also had authors on like, they had panels on other subjects. And I was like, you know, can we have a Dalit critic on the movie panel? Can we have a Dalit critic on the poetry panel? And this is something that should be coming from goodwill. Like the point that Drubo made, like if you're just doing it from guilt, then you're not doing it from your whole heart. You're doing as much, as little as you need to do to pass that test, right? So, and then also the point that Drubo made that, you know, how many strategies is too many strategies. And that's the same thing I see in America where there are certain panels which are just white people. And that panel is not going beyond the white person's perspective, right? So if you're having a panel on climate change or something, like even if you're only concerned with the intellectual roundedness of that panel, like you don't even have to be tremendously cast positive, but your panel is not bringing all perspectives if you're bringing only Savarna white people or so, Savarna people, white people, urban Savarna. So that is a thing that organizers have to think and it has to sometimes come from the inside. Like I can't scold you into doing that. You have to understand that my topic is not complete if I haven't heard from several different kinds of Indian. Yeah, I guess that's that's the point that I wanted to make. Uh, I mean, you got to hear from sci-fi. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, it's an issue that I have deeply, you know, I have had to confront all our lives, you know, whether you are a Kashmiri poet or a poet, you know, and uh, this is a question that is asked often of us, you know, would you exist independent of Kashmir? And, you know, a lot of uh, who, those who are writing, you know, you know, we are faced as an editor of a journal, you know, I'm particularly faced with this conundrum. You know, should I accept writings which are, uh, you know, which will make sense to you for use of a better way, or which will exist only if, you know, uh, Kashmir exists. If Kashmir is removed from the picture, if you have like a new critique, remove the author completely, will that writing pass the standard of canon? All right. So that's a negotiation we have to continuously deal with. But I think, uh, you know, to some of us, the choice does not exist at all. Mm -hmm. You know, to some of us, it is, uh, we call it a misfortune or call it a choice foisted by our circumstances that, you know, try as hard as we can, we cannot break out of the shackles of our identity first. Because the concerns of identity are such that, you know, 101 is never enough. It never ends, that 101. There is so much to say in 101. And your whole identity is shaped by that 101. What else will you speak? For example, you know, I have never been able to write, like Dhruva says, you know, uh, uh, you know, to write about, you know, he won't give an example of journalism. Supposing a Dalit wants to write about the, you know, who is best in fashion or who is this in fashion. So recently I have been thinking on this, you know, there have been anthologies, some interesting anthologies coming. For example, one came on erotic poetry and the other has come on feminism. All right. So I would have liked to contribute to them. But yes, the question is, Am I able to contribute to them? The answer I so, ask myself is no. I am not able to do it because my writing is so shaped and so steeped in Kashmir that I cannot write. Yes, Mimi, you wanted to respond. So that is where this question also becomes double-edged. You know, Chandramohan, the main question that you asked about um, can we write in the general field is the question, right? And the question is double-edged because sometimes, especially people who are hostile to you, they mean that if you have to write in the general field, you have to write like the Savarna. Like your writing has to pass as if your 
body or your subjectivity is not there in it. Like say erotic poetry, right? I mean, do Kashmiris not feel erotic? I'm sure they do. So the point is, can you write in the general field while being the person you are? Will that will the general field accept that? That is my question. Like and to write erotic, erotic poetry, poetry, yeah. It's like yeah. a very uh, very tricky situation where, say, an Afro-American writer is asked to write a uh, general story, right? Yeah, and and love story, is, like a love story. That is something. Yeah, that is something story. African American writers push back against. That you know, if you want a love story, what's wrong with two black people loving each other? Like, why does exactly, it have to be exactly. a story that about? Point. So th that's what yeah. I wanted to say. You know, uh, the, the 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 writer could very cleverly subvert the notion of what is a generic story and bringing very bring in very clever subtext, which are like right. you know. And, and, and the thing is, we are not always allowed to do that. Like say, Drubo is a fashion expert. Like Drubo dresses greatly, and the point is, why would Drubo have to write like a Savarna person, like from a Savarna perspective about fashion? Like, do we not wear clothes? Like, do we? Like, why is it understood that we can't have, like, with our Dalit subjectivity, also have an opinion on dressing, right? And sometimes our Dalit subjectivity gives us a very different opinion on dressing because we don't come from the same kind of respectability politics of Savarna people. Like, you know, I dye my hair like this. Like, my parents are probably a little less or were when I was growing up. I'm now an adult. I can do what I want. But say the kind of Savarna Hindu family respectability politics that Savarna girls were subjected to as I was growing up in the city, because you know, they are valuable in the marriage market. Like their families don't want them stained. Well, my family was also, I mean, sure, they had imbibed a little bit of Savarna culture. So yes, there was a little bit of respectability politics, but it wasn't that hard. So, you know, there's a different kind of understanding, different kind of perspective from Dalit background, also into things like fashion, right? Like we have a different relationship to it than Savarnas do. And Savarnas don't, like these are not narratives we're getting to hear because you're not letting the Dalit person write on home, write on fashion. Like there, there is a different Dalit perspective. There may be a different Kashmiri perspective on all subjects. And like, you know, recently there have been some great writing on Dalit food. And these, these are very different narratives, very different fields from Savarna anything. It will not get explored if you don't let Dalit writers write in those verticals. Exactly. I couldn't agree more. Uh, unless some of, one of you have a closing remark, maybe like it's time to... I just wanted to say I had a really great time listening to both Mimi and Rubo. It was so we, we could even think of like documenting this in a text, you know, post this if if you have the time. Like, yeah, yeah, uh, it was fantastic uh, listening to. Thanks so much. It, it's it's all good. It was great uh, getting to know you and how nuanced your perspectives were. I believe like we are just setting out to you know, like I think the journey for a larger for a more inclusive world. It's just you know maybe it's, it's like evolving from evolving every day and you know we all of us may have maybe small but important roles to play in that so in, with that note maybe we could call it a day thank, thank, so you, so thank, thank you. you so much thank for you. having us this thank you so have much. have a great day have a great night i guess yeah. you all. thank you so much yeah. you call yourself an artist on what ground Drown, baby, drown. Just because you're a square peg in a round hole doesn't make you better than the crowd. Drown, baby, drown. It's lonely at the top, lonelier still at the bottom, because the artist cannot be the sole audience. Drown. Baby, drown.
No, no, I'm not busy. Tell me. Uh huh. Uh huh. Hold on. Hey, wallets are so. Let me e-wallet it for you. Uh huh. <clears throat> Battery. Keep the change. Trade by battery, get spiked. Download the Spike app or visit spike.com to rent a power bank at the nearest location.